En 1845, el hambre invade Europa. Un hongo letal, Phytophthora infestans, escapa de Sudamérica y comienza una plaga que mata todo lo que toca. Everywhere in Europe, where the potato was an important part of people's diet, was affected by a serious food crisis. La maladie de la pomme de terre, elle est insérée dans un autre ensemble de crises frumentaires qui entraînent, disons, des difficultés, des gens qui sont beaucoup plus faibles, des diarrhées, des dysenteries. An estimated 100,000 people die from famine-related causes, particularly in Belgium and in Holland and the Kingdom of Prussia. En Irlanda, donde un tercio de los 8 millones de irlandeses dependen casi exclusivamente de la patata como fuente de alimentación primaria, la hambruna duró siete años. Proportionately, this catastrophe kills one in eight of every person living on the island. That puts it amongst one of the greatest famines in global history. The Great Famine changed Ireland in so many ways. One million dead, two million emigrated. Una gran masa de migrantes irlandeses se convierten en refugiados en los mares, desesperados por empezar una nueva vida. So they're starting the bottom in America. There is a ladder in America. Now why God do that child? Como en las hambrunas más recientes, hay comida disponible, pero solo para quien se lo pueda permitir. En la gran hambruna, solo los más pobres se murieron de hambre y perecieron. Not all Irish people are descendants of people who suffered during the famine. Some Irish people are descendants of people who prospered during the famine. In the late 1840s, it's survival of the fittest in certain parts of the country. The famine occurs in one of the wealthiest parts of the world, in the British Empire. So how could something like this be allowed to have occurred? Great Britain fails Ireland in a catastrophic way. Neglect, indifference, cold-heartedness, insufficient humanitarian care for the Irish. All of those million people were real, warm, living, flesh and blood individuals. There were sons, there were daughters, there were fathers, there were mothers, there were lovers, there were sweethearts, they were your neighbor. In relative time, we are actually quite close. We're maybe five or six generations away from the worst catastrophe in our history. En las décadas anteriores a la gran hambruna, Europa pasa por tumultos y transformaciones. Inspirados por las ideas de la Ilustración y de la Revolución de Estados Unidos, la gente se rebeló ante la monarquía. Desde Francia a España, de Alemania a Grecia, la gente pidió el fin de la desigualdad, de la pobreza y de las injusticias sociales y la implantación de naciones regidas por la democracia. It was an undemocratic world. It was a world in which the poor had very little voice. Antes de la hambruna, Gran Bretaña se separa. Con un imperio por todo el mundo, se confía en su posición como la nación más poderosa del mundo. British society transforms socially and economically in this period. This is a revolution. Los avances en las técnicas y el crecimiento de la población provocan que muchos dejen el campo para buscar una nueva vida en la ciudad. People are pouring in from rural areas, crowding into the towns, the new megacities that have grown up as a result of the industrial revolution. And with this rise in population comes one of the greatest social ills of the Victorian era, and that's poverty. Attitudes towards the poor were very negative, but they were particularly negative towards the Irish poor. Their poverty is not exaggerated. <laughs> 
put us on the verge of human misery. <laughs> Their cottages would scarce serve as pigsties in Scotland. For centuries past, the native Irish, so the Catholic Irish, had been cast into a subservient status. And very definitely, there was a common understanding of Catholic Irish as inferior. Desde la conquista y colonización de la isla en los siglos XV y XVI, Irlanda estaba bajo el gobierno británico. Según el Acta de Unión de 1801, Irlanda estaría completamente sometida a Gran Bretaña. En teoría, se debería tratar a los irlandeses igual que a los ingleses, escoceses y galeses. En la práctica, se les trata con prejuicio y desdén en su territorio. The Irish were thought to be feckless, thought to be lazy, indolent is a word that's used commonly at the time. They needed to be led, they had very little initiative themselves. They were often considered to be the lowest of the low. The function of Ireland, from British perspective, is basically what can we get out of it? We've got the land now, we own it. Un 95% de la superficie de Irlanda pertenece a un pequeño grupo de protestantes leales a la corona británica. The ascendancy, the elites, the major land owners, the estate owners, the titled families. We have approximately 5,000 families who would belong to that class. They supplied members of parliament, They were the local authorities in many ways. La élite cultivaba su granja para producir grandes cantidades de comida, que en su mayoría exportaba a Gran Bretaña. On the eve of the famine, 90 million eggs every year were exported to Britain. Salmon, all sorts of fish, alcohol, enough corn is being exported from Ireland to feed two million people in Britain. And so some people would describe Ireland by the 1830s, 1840s as being the bread basket of Britain. Ireland is an agricultural district of England, for which it heals corn, wool, cattle and military recruits. A diferencia de Gran Bretaña, el cultivo en Irlanda no está modernizado. Millones de arrendatarios agrícolas con y sin tierras trabajan en el campo. Estos arrendatarios alquilan pequeñas granjas a la élite. Los aparceros no trabajan por dinero, sino a cambio de un trozo de tierra del que sobrevivir. Los que no tienen tierras tampoco trabajan por dinero, sino por el permiso de ocupar un terreno accidentado. Aunque no tienen dinero, pueden confiar en una cosa. La nutritiva patata que plantan en las crestas que a día de hoy siguen en el terreno. It's very easy to propagate it, so you just cut a bit off a potato, you take it off and you plant it and off you go. It could be planted in poor land, mountainous conditions and still provide. As long as the potato held, they were very well nourished. They were not poor, but they were very well nourished. Here you had a God-given food stock that was hugely nourishing, that would grow almost anywhere and it fueled the population explosion. The decade or two before the famine, the population increases massively from over 3 million people in the 1780s right up to 8 million in 1841. And so there's a huge pressure for land. The population surged up the valleys, they surged onto the bogs, they surged into Connemara, they surged into areas which hadn't really been very heavily populated before. El censo de 1841 registró que la población de Reino Unido superaba los 27 millones. Los irlandeses representaban un tercio. 
El censo también registra el alcance de la pobreza en Irlanda. Tres millones de personas viven en chozas hechas de piedra o barro. Dos millones más siguen siendo pobres. Viven en chozas primitivas clasificadas como de cuarta categoría. The forecast housing would be a single room mud hovel, basically built of organic material. There are neither windows, bedsteads, tables, no chairs. And oftentimes you could see generations living in the same hovel. There are some later photographs which have been misidentified as famine photographs. Generally, they're from the 1870s and later. But many of those images are depicting conditions which have been very similar to the famine period. The whole West of Ireland was full of these kind of settlements. Geographers sometimes called clockens which in the Irish language were called Bolia, which means a little settlement or village, but not a village in the European sense. It's a village of just farming people. There's no shops, there's no pubs. It's often groups of kin-related people. And these were very vibrant in terms of oral culture. They were singing, they were dancing. You know, they were face-to-face -face neighbors. Patrick, Hugh, James, Brian, Mary, Bridget. You know, they're people with recognizable names. They had human wants, they had human desires, they had human frailties. They loved each other, they hated each other. They drank, they smoked, they played music, they danced. The majority were Irish speaking. They were living, breathing people. Los siglos de ocupación británica han provocado que no se utilice tanto el irlandés, pero los analfabetos pobres siguen usándolo. Esta lengua ancestral se usa en la cultura, en los cuentos y en las canciones. En su viaje por Irlanda un año antes de la hambruna, la filántropa estadounidense Asenath Nicholson experimentó la vitalidad de la cultura. At night we had full proof of Irish merriment. They ate their potatoes and rose to play. The dancing and singing were so boisterous they shook the cabin and reached the ears of most of the neighborhood. And nowadays, when we look at the west of Ireland, we see emptiness and remoteness. But all the people talking about a pre-famine, what they talk about is the noise. Everywhere people talked, there was constant noise, constant chatting, constant hubbub. One of the saddest things during the famine is that that culture disappears or weakens dramatically. Antes de la hambruna, no todos son pobres. El censo de 1841 clasifica a 3 millones de personas en la clase media, granjeros y comerciantes, profesionales y tenderos que viven en la ciudad. Desde la emancipación católica de principios del siglo XIX, liderada por Daniel O'Connell, Gran Bretaña ha otorgado una mayor igualdad de derechos a los católicos irlandeses. Aquellos con acceso al dinero y a una educación han aumentado su rango social para unirse a sus colegas protestantes. Algunos han comprado tierras que han alquilado a los rangos más bajos. Las autoridades británicas son conscientes de la pobreza en Irlanda. A muchos les preocupa que solo dependan de una fuente alimentaria. The little industry called for to rear the potato leads the people to indolence and all kinds of vice, which habitual labor and higher order of food would prevent. Los informes del gobierno concluyen que no es una forma de vida sostenible. There is nowhere in the world today where the dependence on a single food is as great as it was in Ireland in the 1840s. You have poor housing, you have endemic poverty, you have a single food source, which was a kiss of death. It's a system that built towards disaster, really, from every perspective. 
Desde los Andes, en Sudamérica, el hongo Phytophthora infestans escapa al norte y cruza el Atlántico en cargueros. En el verano de 1845, la plaga llega al puerto de Amberes. Llega en el momento de maduración de la patata. Cruza Bélgica, Países Bajos, Francia y Prusia. Todo lo que toca lo destruye. Millones se enfrentan a la hambruna y las autoridades quieren salir en su ayuda. Donc, décisions qui sont prises dans les municipalités, qui vont essayer donc de faire un cours forcé du blé. On va créer des soupes plus ou moins populaires. On va créer en Belgique des travaux, des travaux d'intérêt public. On ne peut pas dire que les autorités se désintéressent du tout. Et il y a une, une vision qui, à court et à, et à long terme, Al llegar a Irlanda, la plaga se extiende gracias a su clima. The withering breath of a simoon seemed to sweep over the land. People notice a blackening of leaves in the field and they also notice a smell. Can you imagine that mentality? My God, what I depend on for my existence is rotting in front of my eyes as I look at it. I saw whole tracts of potato growth changed in one night from smiling luxuriance to a shriveled and blackened waste. Se pierde un tercio de los cultivos. Un millón de personas sin apenas comida. En Londres, el primer ministro Robert Peel entiende el impacto que podría tener esta hambruna. No sería la primera de Irlanda. Sir Robert Peel, his first government job had been as chief secretary for Ireland back in the 1810s. He'd been home secretary in the 1820s. So he knew Ireland very well. And Peel, due to a sense perhaps this will be another short term failure, is relatively quick and relatively generous in terms of his, his intervention. Pero también sabe que cualquier ayuda a los irlandeses ha de implementarse sin ofender a los defensores del libre mercado. La política económica británica está ligada a la CFR, a los principios de libre mercado de John Locke y Adam Smith. Smith's central argument was that the hidden hand of the economy, the magic of the market, distributed resources more efficiently than any government could. Their decree was that it is the role of government to facilitate employment, work, not to be giving handouts to people, even people in dire need. It is no man's business to provide for another. Peel está decidido a ayudar. Su gobierno establece una comisión de ayudas temporal que crea cientos de comités por Irlanda. Estos comités voluntarios distribuyen maíz barato importado de América. Crea trabajo público para que los pobres puedan trabajar por el maíz. El mensaje es claro. Los pobres deben trabajar por cualquier ayuda. Liberal political economy implied that if you gave people welfare, or benefits without linking that to work or productive employment, you would create, in effect, a parasitic or drone class. Las condiciones de los proyectos de infraestructura son duras y el salario es bajo para que se apunten los más desesperados. The work should be as repulsive as possible, consistent with humanity. That is, paupers would rather do the work than starve. 
Aunque las ayudas se otorgan con unas condiciones estrictas, las medidas de Peel son un éxito. Nadie muere de hambre en Irlanda durante el invierno de 1845. Sin embargo, en Gran Bretaña se le critica. Será más criticado cuando para abaratar el maíz deroga las leyes que establecían un arancel a las importaciones. And that triggered a downfall in the government and the creation of a new Liberal Party government under the leadership of Sir John Russell. Russell's party and Russell's government is also deeply factionalized. He's a weak prime minister with very little, if you like, personal authority. When he comes to power in June of 1846, the famine is not in his agenda. He believes it'll be over by the summer. That's what had been predicted. Pero en 1846 vuelve la plaga. Esta vez mata a casi todos los cultivos en Irlanda. And somewhere between three quarters and nine tenths of the potato crop is wiped out in one week. In the last week of July, first week of August of 1846. I shall not readily forget the day. I could scarcely bear the fearful smell which came up so rank from the deceitfully luxuriant stalks. The crop was worthless. Therefore, the livelihood and the food of the millions who depended mainly on the potato, that's gone. It's really only with the failure of the crop in 46 that the realization, I think, struck, hey, this is massive. So 46 becomes, in effect, the first year of sustained serious famine. We entered a cabin in one dark corner with three children huddled together, perfectly emaciated, eyes sunk, voices gone, evidently in the last stage of starvation. Given that this is the second year of crisis, people's resources running out in the countryside. Such is the scale of the widespread hunger that even the crows have been reduced to skeletons. So people have been able to perhaps get through one year by selling their pigs, by pawning their agricultural tools, their clothes, by perhaps not paying their rent. In the second year, there's nothing left to pawn, there's nothing left to sell. La gente rebusca y roba por sobrevivir. La pesca tampoco es posible. Han vendido y empeñado sus barcos. Recogen todo lo que pueden de la costa. In Ballyhoig, great misery prevails. A woman was drowned in endeavoring to gather seaweed, the only food to be procured for herself and her wretched family. Now you have a problem that you don't have enough food to feed people. Who do you feed? Do you feed the teenage boys because they might be able to earn a few shillings working on the road? Do you feed the grandparents because maybe you feel they're at the end of their life. And you now have horrendous choices to make. In a sense, you have to decide who do you want to live and who do you want to die? What would you do? Very rapidly in the course of the late autumn, early winter of 1846, we hear reports of deaths taking place on a significant scale. Mary Ann McDermott lived the past four months by begging. The deceased had some green of bad quality in her stomach and a small quantity of turnips in her bowels insufficient to sustain life. The jury found her death arose from want of nourishing food. During the famine, people would have died from primarily infectious diseases, uh, so famine diseases, things like uh, typhus and uh, typhoid fever and, and cholera and so on. Las infecciones se propagaban por las ciudades. People must have laid down and died. Family must have laid down and died. You know, parents must have children died. Children must have parents died. 
the burial of their own dead was massively important to people and they went to extraordinary lengths to see that the dead were properly buried. Como los recursos se agotaban, hubo que renunciar a las tradiciones. So there was cats going every day carrying people to the local graveyards. To facilitate their burial, the only option was to bury them in mass graves. Actualmente, encontramos zonas de enterramiento con los restos de miles de personas. Lápidas sin nombre, su identidad olvidada. You had the sense that death becomes denuded of its dignity. En 1846, el Illustrated de London News le encarga unos dibujos a James Mahoney. El recuerdo de la hambruna. Not far from where I made this sketch, six dead bodies had lain for 12 days without the least chance to interment, owing to their being so far from town. The interesting thing about 19th century illustration is that it's a nascent medium. And because of that, there are a lot of artistic conventions which govern how representation can appear. So you don't see starving and emaciated bodies. It's mediated. It's oftentimes romanticized. It's often sanitized as well. Nevertheless, it does show the extent of devastation in a way that audiences had never seen before. La crisis de Irlanda preocupa al gobierno. People within government are getting very concerned about the amount of money the taxpayers, ratepayers, are paying in Irish relief. There was quite a bit of tension between the English officials in Dublin, saying, you know, there's famine, there's famine, and the Treasury in London saying, they're exaggerating, they're exaggerating. We'll do something, but we can't be lavishing England's largesse in Ireland. Except through the purgatory of misery and starvation, I cannot see how Ireland is to emerge into a state of anything approaching prosperity. Algunas personas en el gobierno ven la hambruna como una oportunidad para modernizar Irlanda y para reducir la población sobrante de gente pobre. I think it very probable that we may derive much advantage from this present calamity. The British already had in their mind a template of what they would like in Ireland and getting rid of all these people, introducing what they thought of as modern farming methods, as it were, fast forward in Ireland into a version of Scotland and Wales which would be absorbed peaceably into the British state. You have to realize the self-indulgence of the English self-image at that particular stage. We are the greatest in the world, which in many respects I agree that were. En invierno mueren miles de personas a la semana. El gobierno de Russell deja de abastecer maíz barato. The winter of 1846 to 47 was the coldest for 100 years. It snowed as late as April in the west of Ireland. La única ayuda del Estado es el trabajo en obras públicas. El fin de los cultivos de patata ha provocado que el precio de otros alimentos supere los salarios de la clase obrera. Aún así, Charles Trevelyan, secretario adjunto de Hacienda, los disminuye un 20%, de 10 peniques a 8 al día. En marzo, 700.000 personas trabajan en las obras. Estos proyectos pretenden modernizar el país. Se crean o renuevan muelles y puertos en la costa. Muchos siguen en pie. Se implantan proyectos de drenaje en la zona central y oeste. Se construyen carreteras. A veces reducen los días de viaje. Aunque la mayoría de los proyectos no tienen sentido. Conducen a la nada. They were of little value, bar creating work to give money 
And as one contemporary report in a Kilkenny newspaper, he said the country is riddled with useless robes. La gente trabaja con apenas comida en el estómago. Muchos viven lejos. Al estar tan débiles, duermen en las obras, expuestos al invierno. Had the poor creatures got this alliance at their homes, it would have been relief. But in the way it was given, it meant slow murder. The whole system was perverse. Instead of prolonging life, it probably in lots of cases it killed people. En Francia, Países Bajos y Bélgica, la gente no depende de la patata tanto como en Irlanda. Aquí la hambruna se acentúa con la inflación del precio del trigo. Qui fait que le blé est beaucoup plus élevé, beaucoup plus cher, et que donc les gens ne peuvent pas acheter du pain ou ont faim parce que ils ne peuvent pas acheter de pain. En 1846 y 1847, miles de personas mueren de hambre en el norte de Europa. Si las autoridades no hubiesen intervenido antes, habría habido más muertes. When the crisis broke, they moved to stop the problem. Banning food exports, establishing public works. The French gave free bread to the people in the public works. They tried to control prices. Las autoridades europeas quieren controlar el malestar social que podría provocar la falta de alimento. Governments in Europe had witnessed revolutions very recently. There'd been the massive revolution in France in 1789, which had an impact all over Europe. Alors, il y a une dimension de préservation de l'ordre social. On sait que si on veut préserver la paix civile, si on veut éviter d'avoir des jacqueries, comme le XVIIIe siècle en a connu beaucoup, y compris de, de, des jacqueries euh, énormes, nationales, il faut, euh, faut que les gens puissent manger à leur faim. A woman with a dead child in her arms was begging on the street yesterday. Notwithstanding all the distress, the market was supplied with meat, bread and fish. Incluso en los peores años de la hambruna, los mercados irlandeses están llenos. Se sigue exportando comida a Gran Bretaña como de costumbre. We saw droves of bullocks winding their weary way to some port to be shipped to Liverpool. Algunos afirman que Irlanda necesita el dinero de las exportaciones para que la economía siga a flote. One issue with stopping exports in Ireland is that if you impose that kind of a restriction for several years in succession, farmers will not grow anything because you would remove the incentive farmers had to produce. There's something visibly wrong with taking food further beyond reach of people. Something wrong with that. And deep inside us all, we know the British government should have closed Irish ports. They should have refused to allow food to leave the country. Whether it would have fed everybody, it wouldn't. We would have fed somebody. There was a good deal of protesting in the early stages of the famine. They would riot against bakers. They would riot against retailers. Towns and villages are invaded and plundered by armies of idle laborers who famish for want of bread and will not be put off. These are not really a revolutionary protest. They happen spontaneously. They are focused on one issue, food scarcity, the scarcity of food. Aun enfadados, los irlandeses, cansados y demacrados, no suponen ningún peligro. Gran Bretaña sabe, por otras revoluciones, que la isla cuenta con un gran ejército. It had taken them a long time to conquer Ireland, so the military are there to contain. The number of soldiers in Ireland in 1843 is 15,000. The number of military in Ireland in 1947 is 29,000. It has doubled. Once people realize that the situation is hopeless, 
the instinct to protest and to try and do something about it gives way to apathy and resignation and despair. Donde las autoridades flaquean, médicos, clérigos y organizaciones benéficas tratan de llenar el vacío en la primera línea. La sociedad religiosa de los amigos, o quakers, tiene un gran impacto. There are roughly 3,000 Quakers within Ireland on the eve of the famine, and they were tremendously helpful in their reliefs to try and stave off the worst effects of famine among the poor. They also took a really important and active role in setting up soup kitchens across the country, in places like Yall, in Waterford, in Kerry, for example. Los curas católicos y clérigos protestantes recaudaron dinero para comprar comida y ropa a los pobres. A algunos protestantes se les acusa de proselitismo a cambio de comida. A la mayoría les mueve el altruismo. We see lots of clergy dying, Protestant and Catholic. We see relief officials, both paid by the state and also voluntary relief officials dying. We see doctors dying. 27 curas y clérigos y al menos 10 quakers mueren tratando de salvar la vida de los irlandeses. Les motivaba su fe cristiana. Sin embargo, otros entienden otro mensaje de la palabra de Dios. God, grant that we might rightly perform our part and not turn into a curse what was intended as a blessing. For people who are evangelical providentialists like Charles Trevelyan and many of his supporters, the famine is not an accident. It's seen as a direct intervention by God in the natural world because it's delivered by a blight. And you might then say that this is a judgment of God on these papers, potato-eaten Irish. So the worst thing you can do is to prevent God's will taking place by intervening too much. It's the combination of that providentialism, of that laissez-faire, or as we would now say, neoliberal economics, and early proto-racial thinking. Remember, everybody in the 19th century world was a racist. And it's that trifecta of racism, providentialism, laissez-faire economics, which creates the real tragedy of the famine. On Friday, 22nd January 1847, Dr. Daniel O'Donovan, late one evening, opened the door of his house to find a woman standing there. She was emaciated, she was in fever. It was as if the grave had at that moment vomited her forth. La señora Keating necesita la ayuda del doctor Donovan, pero a él le da miedo exponer la vida de sus hijos y le ofrece dinero para irse. I don't want this. My child is dead for over a week, and I need somebody to come and bury him. That the neighbors wouldn't help to bury the child, and that she was afraid that the pigs would eat her child. And the doctor went out to the house, which he described as being like a sewer. On the ground lay two children, and in the ditch in front of the door was a coffin containing the putrid body of a dead boy of seven years old. There was something so awe-inspiring in this spectre-looking woman that I yielded to her entreaties. The coffin was purchased. And in all, he buried three of her children, and he then buried herself. Para 1847, la muerte acecha en toda la isla. Sobre todo en el sur y en el oeste. Pero en el este y el norte también hay miles de muertos. En Garvery Wood, hundreds de corpses are buried. And their relatives too weak to carry them to the graveyard. The idea comes down to us is that Ulster was relatively untouched by the famine. The actual mortality rate in Ulster is significant. 
There are thousands of famine-related deaths in Belfast and the surrounding towns. Lurgan, for example, has a massive outbreak of typhus fever. It's one of the stopping points for people coming from the west, hoping to get to Belfast to get relief or to get a boat to get off the island. Empiezan a darse desahucios. Las familias que ya no pueden pagar el alquiler o trabajar deben desalojar sus casas. Los refugiados se agrupan en las chabolas de las ciudades. La sociedad empieza a colapsar. You can see this mass body of people moving and that brings its own tensions. People are fearful of the disease being carried. Hunger drives them to desperation and you read accounts of robberies, murders that are committed by people as they move along the way. The country is in a state of anarchy. The industrious feel uneasy for the safety of their property. Cattle and sheep being carried away, petty robberies committed on almost every road. Self-preservation, the urge to live, causes people to maybe leave their spouses, reject their children, rob from their neighbors, steal, and in extremis, you know, fight or maybe kill people for food. There are reports from Curra of half-buried bodies, of a mother and children eaten by dogs, and bodies of people who had died a fortnight previously, left for weeks where they expired. Are we really living in a portion of the United Kingdom? The famine, it actually coincides with the explosion of the mass media in the 19th century. Because you have the emergence and really the invention of illustrated journalism at this exact point in the 19th century, the Irish famine becomes one of the first sort of visually mediated catastrophes. On a des journaux comme l'Illustration et qui non seulement évoque la famine mais la montre en quelque sorte de la même façon que l'Illustrated London News la montre au public britannique. Las noticias de los medios motivan a las donaciones por todo el mundo en 1846 y 47. Desde los irlandeses de América llegan comida y suministros, valorados en más de un millón de dólares. El banquero inglés Lionel de Rothschild recauda 400.000 libras para la Asociación de Ayudas Británica. La reina Victoria recurre a los ciudadanos británicos y recauda 170.000 libras. El zar ruso, el sultán Abdulmecid de Turquía y los oficiales británicos en Calcuta también contribuyen generosamente. Y desde América, a pesar de su propia pobreza, los Choctaw y los Cherokee envían 800 dólares. El papa Pío IX lanza una encíclica para los católicos para ayudar a los irlandeses. Les évêques, les curés vont obliger, on leur demande hein, dans leur sermon le dimanche de parler de la situation de l'Irlande. Il y a une connaissance hein, de, des fléaux qui touchent l'Irlande, la pauvre Irlande. L'Irlande est un vaste tombeau dans lequel étaient ensevelis chaque jour des milliers d'infortunés moissonnés par la fièvre et la famine. Los franceses donan más de 50.000 libras para los pobres irlandeses. La Irlande es católica, la Francia es católica. Cuando la Iglesia, después de socorrer a los irlandeses, hay una solidaridad católica. Sin embargo, las ayudas humanitarias no son suficientes para alimentar a los millones de irlandeses. El mundo está observando y Gran Bretaña sabe que tiene que ayudarles más. El canciller de Hacienda, Charles Wood, no quiere seguir destinando el dinero de los contribuyentes a ayudar a Irlanda. There is a financial crisis which begins through the collapse of the railway bubble. And in 1847, two successive banking crises happen within Britain that is occupying a lot of the attention of the government and of parliament. The only way it can continue funding Irish relief is to raise taxes within Britain. And of course, this is a very unpopular move amongst the public. who don't want to be funding Irish relief 
Charles Wood decreta que no se va a gastar más dinero de los contribuyentes en los irlandeses. También se anuncia un cambio en la política. Se clausura el trabajo público. En su lugar se abrirán cientos de comedores sociales en la isla. Se alimentará gratuitamente. El coste de los comedores lo cubrirá un préstamo de hacienda y las altas tasas a los terratenientes. Tasas que apenas pueden permitirse pagar. Landlords aren't able to collect rents. They're not in a position themselves to be able to pay the, the rates. Many of them were debt ridden to an extreme. Los comedores sociales abren en junio de 1847. Esta operación logística sin precedentes alimenta a 3 millones al día con un guiso de maíz, arroz y cereales. The greatest achievement of British policy and Irish participation are the soup kitchens. And it wasn't expensive. The public works before them had cost over 5 million. The total cost for the soup kitchens was 1.75 million. El verano de 1847 trae más ayudas. La plaga no vuelve. No se han plantado muchas patatas, así que los cultivos no valen la pena. Sin la sopa gratis, los pobres morirían. And then they declared the famine over. The famine is over. And no further financial aid can be justified. Why does he say that? I think it's because it's tied into this idea the famine was a divine intervention. The blight was the agent of divine providence to force Ireland to change itself. And if the blight isn't there in the summer of 1847, Trevelyan is using that to close down the argument that there is a continuing famine crisis. He is wrong. He's absolutely wrong. no se ha terminado. Aún así, los comedores cierran, dejando a cuatro millones sin una fuente de alimentación. That was a callous decision, because so many will die on the basis of that decision. El gobierno promulga una nueva ley. Dice que las próximas medidas de ayuda en Irlanda se realizarán con los impuestos recaudados en Irlanda. What's called the Poor Law Amendment Act is passed in 1847, and that means no more government grants and loans from London. Everything is to be paid for out of a local taxation. En Gran Bretaña se cree que la hambruna está causada por la mala gestión de los terratenientes. The Irish landlords, as a class, have shown no capacity for the business of landlords. Esta ley establece nuevas tasas para los propietarios y sus arrendatarios. It's very difficult to see how elites at the time expected ratepayers to be able to fund this situation. Some landlords are hugely indebted and they are just not equipped to pay the costs of famine relief within Ireland. Un terrateniente irlandés, William Gregory, del condado Galway, propone una modificación. Dice que los arrendatarios de tierras mayores a un cuarto de acres tienen que renunciar a ellas si quieren percibir ayudas. People who'd survived having gone through unknown hardships. It really forced them after 1847 to make that very difficult decision. If they wanted relief, to give up their land. Cuando se vota la ley en Westminster, de los 29 irlandeses en la Cámara, 26 votan a favor y solo 3 en contra. Muchos de los que están a favor tienen arrendatarios en Irlanda. We have landowners in a sense being taxed predominantly to pay for this poor law system, but then responding by clearing their estates to try and reduce their tax burden. Whether it's intentional or not, the extended poor law acts as a stimulus for landowners to remove large numbers of people from their estates. It's murder, basically. 
It's not murder in the sense of direct murder, but it's basically condemnation to starvation. En los siete años de hambruna, se desahucia a más de medio millón de personas. Las fotografías de décadas posteriores muestran lo que ocurría. Police reluctantly proceed, armed with bayonet and muskets, but the tenants make some show of resistance, for these hovels have been built by themselves or their forefathers. And if people had locked themselves in the house or refused to come out, they would use the crowbar to tear down. They would then set fire to the roof so that people couldn't come back. The people that are actually tearing down houses, doing the dirty work, are local people themselves and they know them. And that causes great animosity in local communities. People take shelter on beaches, in ditches, anywhere, because they couldn't go to the property of any other landowner. No less than 33 families, numbering in all 145 human beings, stretched along ditches and hedges, many of them children and decrepit old parents, falling victims to cold and hunger and destitution. Algunos terratenientes son más caritativos. Les dan comida y perdonan el alquiler. I have made up my mind that the distress of the poor demands a large sacrifice on the part of the richer, and it must be our business to give up luxuries to meet this. To feed the hungry is a duty that cannot be shirked. De Donegal a Tipperary, de Waterford a Roscommon, de Cork a Tyrone, los desahucios ocurren en casi todo el país. Desde Ballinrobe, en el Condado Mayo, George Bingham, conde de Lucan, demuele 300 cabañas y desahucia a 2.000 personas. En el Condado Clare, más de 1.000 arrendatarios son desahuciados por Crofton Moore Bandelur. En el Condado Kerry, se desahucia a 4.000 arrendatarios mediante un plan de emigración. Al poseer el 95% de Irlanda, la aristocracia es responsable de la mayoría de desahucios, aunque no son los únicos. In the decade before the famine, you find a lot of Irish merchants and shopkeepers purchasing small tracts of land around the towns and villages across the country. There's an awful lot of people living on that land, and when the pressure comes to bear then, they're amongst the first to evict merchants, shopkeepers, publicans, the clergy, Catholic and Church of Ireland, we find evicting people in the late 1840s. Alas, my fine holy people have been starved to death. The landlords of all sects and creeds conspired for their extinction. The Catholic landlords are the most cruelly disposed. Como están obligados a abandonar sus hogares, las ciudades van desapareciendo. Para un artículo del Illustrated London News, James Mahoney dibuja el pueblo abandonado de Tulich en el condado Clare. A día de hoy no queda nada de aquello que dibujó. A 50 kilómetros de Tulik se encuentra con una joven y sus dos hijos. I lived on the lands of Goranatuha. We were put out last November. Antes de su desahucio, otros dos hijos de Bridget O'Donnell habían muerto. Uno era un recién nacido. The whole family got the fever, and one boy, 13 years old, died with hunger while we were lying sick. Cuando Mahoney la encontró, Bridget y sus hijos vivían en un agujero bajo un puente y con miedo de que les echen. No se sabe si sobrevivieron, pero el dibujo de Mahoney se convirtió en una de las representaciones principales de la hambruna irlandesa. There's no extraneous detail, there's no landscape, there's nothing in it to sort of, I suppose, complicate the image. And in, for those reasons, it becomes almost a universal image of famine, that image of a woman and her suffering children. <laughs> 
Aquellos que necesitaban las ayudas solo podían recurrir a los asilos para pobres. Suelen encontrarse en Francia, Países Bajos y América. Solo Gran Bretaña los utiliza como solución ante los desahucios. Solo se da ayudas a quienes aceptan quedarse encerrados en los asilos. Desde 1842 se han construido 130 asilos en casi todas las ciudades. Las condiciones allí son intencionadamente duras. Se separa a las familias. Los hombres, mujeres y niños viven separados y no pueden hablar entre ellos. Todos trabajan por un sustento. Están diseñados para acoger a 100.000 personas. Como no hay otras ayudas disponibles, llegan un millón de personas. La más painful y heartrending scene. Poor wretches in last stages of famine imploring to be received into the house. Women who had six children begging that even two or three might be taken in. They were built to deal with poverty in normal circumstances. They were unable to cope with a tragedy on the scale of the famine. 1,000 or 2,000 great hulks of men lying piled up within brick walls. Did a greater violence to the law of nature ever present itself before? You can argue that it's quite a heartless system, but it's still a place that people did actually get some help. You had medical officers who were really struggling to keep the disease from spreading and caring for people. And people were actually saved in the workhouse as well. Una de cada cinco muertes durante la hambruna tuvo lugar dentro de un asilo u hospital. La mayoría son niños menores de 15 años. Uh, there's a high mortality rate in the workhouses. It's a passageway to the grave. Morir en un asilo garantiza en la mayoría de los casos la dignidad de un entierro. Pero a medida que hay más muertes, los cementerios locales se llenan. You had the stench of the putrefying corpses sort of coming out of the ground. So a massive health hazard. Cuando se excavó la ciudad de Kilkenny, el arqueólogo forense Johnny Gerber descubrió fosas comunes. Eventually they had no other choice than to bury them within the boundary walls of the workhouse. And these were mass burial pits, 63 pits in total. In some situations, you had two individuals in one coffin, an adult, and then the remains of a child placed between the legs of that adult. There were really death traps. By the end of the famine, over 200,000 people have perished in these workhouses. A mile from where I was born, there's a gate which is called Gatan and Jori, the Gate of Tears. And it's because that was where, when children were emigrating, and remember when children emigrated, you weren't going to see them again. They had to turn from their parents. Imagine that turn there, and know they would never see their parents, never see that valley, never see that world again. And all they could bring with them was their desperation and their hunger to succeed, their hunger to make a new world. Los migrantes desesperados hacían lo posible por encontrar un billete. A 50.000 irlandeses les pagan el billete sus terratenientes a modo de compensación por su desahucio. La mayoría tiene que pagar su propio billete. 
se suele enviar a un hijo mayor a buscar trabajo para que ahorre y compre un billete para el siguiente miembro. The emigrants of this year are not like those of former ones. They are now actually running away from fever and disease and hunger, with money scarcely sufficient to pay passage for and find food for the voyage. And they were very young. The vast bulk of Irish emigrants in the second half of the 19th century were teenagers, 16, 17, 18. The great Irish ports, Cove, Derry, these are places from which there was a massive hemorrhage of people in the time of the famine. Es un éxodo sin precedentes. Las rutas baratas permiten a los irlandeses viajar al otro lado del mundo. Durante diez años, casi un millón y medio de irlandeses escapan a América. Son 340.000 los que van a Canadá. A Nueva Zelanda y Australia llegan 50.000. Entre los que llegan a Australia, hay 4.000 chicas huérfanas que vienen de los asilos. La mayoría trabajan como empleadas domésticas. Con el tiempo se casan y comienzan a criar familias. En 1847, el puerto de Liverpool se llena de gente. A él llegan 300.000 irlandeses. There is a real sense of the alarm on the part of the Liverpool authorities. You know, they're going to be swamped by this, this you know, ocean of poverty coming across the Irish Sea. The anticipated invasion of Irish pauperism has commenced. 15,000 have already, within the last three months, landed in Liverpool and block up her thoroughfare with masses of misery. Many of these people were very sick. They were malnourished and infection spread. Many of those who were on transit to North America or to Australia actually stayed in Liverpool. Many people ran out of money, others fell sick, so they never made it any further. Casi un tercio de los irlandeses se quedaron en Gran Bretaña. La mayoría son analfabetos, solo hablan irlandés y nunca habían salido de su país. The Irish who arrive in Britain do not tend to excel in terms of economy, in terms of moving up that social scale. A lot of them become subsumed into that larger working class, that part of that urban environment, those people who are working in factories, those people who are part of industrial Britain. Si pueden permitírselo, prefieren cruzar el Atlántico hacia Canadá o Estados Unidos. The Irish were the boat people of the day. The medical inspections are cursory. People are bringing disease onto the ships with them. The ships that crossed to Canada in 1847 by far have the highest mortality rate. These are the infamous coffin ships. Cientos de hombres, mujeres y niños. El 30% de todos los que lo intentaron murieron durante el viaje o en la cuarentena. La ruta a Estados Unidos es más segura. El 90% consigue llegar con vida. Los supervivientes suelen quedarse en la costa este, sobre todo en Massachusetts, Pensilvania y Nueva York. These migrants bring with them disease. So there's a number of, of epidemics which happen in different cities along the Atlantic seaboard in 1847 especially. And so there's a great deal of resentment and hostility towards these new arrivals. The poorest, most wretched population in the world. The scattered debris of the Irish nation. They brought very little with them, except their bodies, um, and their willingness to work. And they had to find a job as quickly as possible. Trevelyan, he said that they were lazy, they didn't want to work. Editorials in the London Times say the same thing. They get to America and they have an opportunity to work. They get to America and there is something for them to do. Of course they want to work. The work was invariably dangerous, noxious. It was work that other Americans, if they could at all, wanted to avoid. 
their carters, their stevedores. They were longshoremen. They worked on the railroad. And they're the guys that build the bridges. The women, they entered the needle trades if they could. But domestic servitude constituted the conduit, if you will, for the vast majority of Irish women who landed in these ports as famine immigrants. Had America not been there, and Canada too, as a kind of a safety valve, the situation would have been much worse in Ireland itself and also in Britain. Because had the people who left not been able to go, there would have been much more pressure on resources in Ireland. So I see emigration as a way of relieving disaster. Para quien se queda en Irlanda, no hay muchas esperanzas. En 1848, la plaga vuelve a arrasar las tierras otro año más. Siguen las muertes, los desahucios y el éxodo. El mundo se ha cansado de la hambruna irlandesa. Famine fatigue refers to the phenomenon where people begin to lose compassion and people begin to lose interest in major catastrophes like famine. While you have this initial charitable response, which happens in 1846 and 1847, after a while, the funds essentially run out. And much of the worst devastation and mortality happens from 1848 and onwards. As if things couldn't get any worse, many landlords now either default or refuse to pay their rents. So many of the Western unions start to go bankrupt. Los asilos se ven obligados a cerrar. Otros están tan llenos que rechazan a gente necesitada. Los desahucios continúan en silencio. Las puertas de las ciudades están cerradas. If you're in a society that's coming under pressure, as Irish society came during the famine, the people who are surviving doing well, let's let us say the middle class, that class becomes harder and becomes colder simply by the denial of charity. The charity that custom would have once demanded was denied frequently during the famine. Algunos no dejan de ser caritativos, generosos y heroicos. The mother striving might and main to protect children, even though the food is so limited. So there'll be lots of humanitarian gestures within the family which take place. What's a much more interesting way to think about the famine is what did the poor do to and for themselves? Those good things that they did, they helped each other. They sought to assist each other. They rioted for food, but they did bad things too. And among the bad things that they did was land grabbing, denying charity to people in need of charity, killing other poor people for food. What happens during famines where people are starving is that it affects not just your physical body, it affects your mental health as well. They were losing empathy towards other people. They become selfish. The crime rate spirals, several murders a day have been committed. There's 20,000 reported crimes in 1848. 20 years later, in 1868, that had fallen to about 2,000. Jimmy Finn found a knife in the house, and with that knife, he killed both children. He killed the girl first, and afterwards the little boy. He took two quarts of flour as he was hungry. The savageness of the murders as well. We read of, of people's throats being cut from ear to ear with bill hooks. Women and, and the elderly are seen as easy targets. You have instances of infanticide, of child desertion, women resorting to prostitution in order to survive. One of the most shocking things about the Great Famine is what people are reduced to eating. People are reduced to eating food that they don't regard as human food. So they're reduced to eating a putrid pig. They're reduced to eating the donkey. They're reduced to eating dogs. And to eat food that is subhuman 
is an index of how you have yourself been reduced. But the ultimate is that you end up eating another human being. Survivor cannibalism, trying to live on the corpses of people who have predeceased you. They might be related to you and they might not. Aunque era raro, se registraron varios casos de canibalismo. In the village of Drimkagi, four were dead together in a poor hut. Brother, two sisters and daughter. The flesh was torn off the daughter's arm and mangled in the mouth of her poor dead mother. And there are documented cases of this in Cork, in Kerry, Galway, in Mayo, in 1847, in 1848, in 1849. William Walsh of Mount Partry and his son were found dead together. Their flesh was torn off their bodies. Flesh was found in their mouths. If you don't believe that this happened or could happen, then you don't really understand what famine is about. Austerity will trace to that famine the commencement of a solitary revolution in the habits of a nation and acknowledge that supreme wisdom has adduced permanent good out of transient evil. The British at that stage were the richest, the most powerful, the most centralized state in the world. They knew about the famine. It wasn't that they didn't know. Sometimes, you know, people can say, oh, well, they didn't know, whatever. God Almighty, there's tons of paper in the National Archives just on the famine alone. They knew. La pérdida de la patata y el aumento en el precio de los alimentos desataron el caos en Europa en 1848. Cada vez hubo más populismo, protestas y revoluciones. 1846-47 c'est une des dernières grandes crises de subsistance euh, européenne. En Irlande, mais même euh, en Grande-Bretagne, euh, en Belgique, en France, euh, peut-être des millions et des millions de gens ont faim dans l'Europe des années 1840. Il y a une, euh, voilà, une, une tension des nationalités, hein, d'aspiration des peuples euh, à, à avoir des droits, à, à pouvoir s'exprimer, qui, qui rencontre aussi des difficultés économiques. C'est aussi une période de grande agitation sociale, les années 1840. Il y a une expression qui est le printemps des peuples. They were agitating, fighting, demonstrating for an idea that rule will be by the people, a nation state. Una ola de revoluciones se extiende por Europa en 1848. Se derrocan monarquías, se demanda una soberanía. Los ciudadanos quieren el control. En abril, un comité de joven Irlanda, un movimiento revolucionario radical, viaja a París para preguntarle al líder revolucionario francés, Alphonse de Lamartine, si les apoyaría en Irlanda. Cansado de la ira irlandesa, se niega. Aun habiendo fracasado, vuelven a Irlanda con la bandera tricolor irlandesa y determinados a luchar contra el gobierno británico. They were driven by two things. One was the famine, obviously, itself. And the other was by the image of what was happening in Europe. We are part of this wider European movement, and we should try to strike a blow. El 28 de julio, los rebeldes se reúnen en Balingarri, condado de Tipperary. There was a hope that the masses would come out and support them. But the masses were a starving peasantry. And support them with what? The bare hands? Tras una escaramuza con la policía, Las tropas se movilizan y se arresta a los rebeldes. Ireland's revolution lasts three hours. Nobody is killed. It's more a gesture. Se les condena a muerte. Pero para evitar más protestas, las ejecuciones no se llevan a cabo. Como en la mayoría de revoluciones europeas en 1848, el legado de la revolución dio sus frutos décadas después. 
el intento de revolución pone aún más en contra a la opinión británica. El gobierno británico decide lavarse las manos completamente. Para enfatizar que la hambruna ha terminado, a Charles Trevelyan le nombran caballero y le otorgan un bonus de un año de salario. Pero la hambruna no ha terminado. En 1849, la plaga vuelve. You can't say that the famine ended in 1849. It began to decline somewhat, but by no means vanish. 50, 51, and even in parts of the country into 52 were famine years. Cuando la crisis alimentaria termina en 1852, partes de las provincias de Munster y Connacht han perdido casi al 50% de su población, un total de 700.000 muertos. Ulster también ha sufrido con 175.000 muertos, la mayoría protestantes y católicos. Las poblaciones de las ciudades han quedado a la mitad. Un legado que no se superará hasta un siglo después. La muerte, emigración, caída del matrimonio y aumento de la infertilidad provocaron que los niños desapareciesen del sur y del suroeste. Desaparecieron 100.000 granjas familiares. Antes de la hambruna, en Irlanda vivían 8 millones y medio de personas. En total, un millón perdieron sus vidas. En esa década se marcharon dos millones para no volver nunca más. The four class housing and the people in them are practically wiped off the face of the earth. Two to three million people gone. Complete destruction of a whole people. The sense of destroying a whole class, it makes a greater impact than war. La mortalidad ha llevado a algunos a categorizarla de genocidio. Genocide is a modern legal concept. We can characterize the management of the famine as partly intended to get rid of the cottier and landless poor of Ireland. An entire social class who were regarded as an obstacle to productive agriculture. But they were not targeted because they were Irish Catholics and Gaelic speakers. They were targeted because of their class characteristics. So they don't meet the genocide convention. And I think, in terms of management of the famine, a charge of geno slaughter would be appropriate. Neglect, indifference, cold heartedness insufficient humanitarian care for the Irish. Writing 40 years after the famine, Hugh Dorian remembered how in the 50s and the 60s, people would come together as they had done before the famine. But there wouldn't be the great keen interest in the happenings of the world around them. He said the people would come together and that they would sit in silence. And you have an image there of a traumatized people, that people had come through something horrendous. Honig, Blantong Horta, Agus Droch Hill, Agus Vrishin Yart, Agus Spirit Nanini, Nira On, Ach Achen Nine, Agira Vebo, Dima on Sport, Agus Akahe Vamshire. Stad an Iliach, Agus an Kjol, Agus Dausa, Warav an Gurta, Achenrod. Dans la longue durée, la mémoire de la famine, c'est vrai que c'est une cicatrice terrible sur la tutelle britannique. La famine, c'est aussi une défaite morale en quelque sorte pour les autorités britanniques qui ont montré leur indifférence à cette catastrophe humaine.
C'est une différence importante de ce point de vue avec l'attitude des gouvernements d'Europe continentale. Las muertes atribuidas a la hambruna en Francia, Bélgica, Prusia y Países Bajos llegan a 100.000 personas. Esa cifra solo es el 10% de la tasa de mortalidad en Irlanda. La diferencia más notable se ha atribuido a la eficacia de las medidas de ayuda de las autoridades europeas. En Belgium the authorities were less judgmental and said, look, there's a problem there, people are starving and we've got to deal with that first and then worry later about other aspects. La Hacienda Británica ha gastado 8 millones de libras en medidas de ayuda para los irlandeses, la mayor parte en préstamos que esperan que se les devuelvan. In the context of the overall United Kingdom tax intake of over 300 million during the famine years, the spend on the Irish famine of 8 million was paltry. It may be worth noting that the totality of military and police costs was 14 million in Ireland at the same time. In the end, policy is about maintaining control, law and order. Algunos se benefician de las pérdidas de sus compatriotas. There were those who would deny for their chance. People are dying, land is being vacated. There is nobody strong enough left to actually resist. Let's grab what we can. You know, it's ours now. They're gone. The big farms grew bigger and they did it by absorbing their neighbors. You walk around any big farm in Ireland and the ghosts of the famine still walk there. Hugh Dorian, when he wrote of the famine in 1890, he said, you know, it was terrible. But he also says that at least when it was over, it got rid of turbulent and indifferent characters who were only a disgrace to the good, to the honest and to the well-doing. Esto también transformó a la Iglesia Católica Irlandesa. Prior to the famine, it was rooted in the seasons in the landscape, like holy wells, the pilgrimages, the holy mountains like Croke Patrick, but it was also very strongly in the Irish language and was really spiritual. The church that emerged after the famine is ultramontane. It looks to build churches, to control people, to bring them inside the church. The church came in as an anchor in a very, very turbulent kind of world, a world of poverty, a world of emigration, a world of family dispersal and breakdown, and the church provided an anchor in that surgency of anxiety. And we became a very pious, not spiritual, very pious people, you know, where respectability mattered, not so much having any real genuine sense of religion, but being seen to, to practice religion, what we used to call in the old days, crawl thumping, you know, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. La gran hambruna marca el principio del fin del gobierno británico sobre casi toda la isla irlandesa. In terms of what you might call political wisdom, political noose, it's one of the biggest own goals in English history. The famine is a major psychological weapon in the hands of Irish Republicans, two generations, three generations on. It leads ultimately to Irish nationalism seeking independence. El revolucionario feniano radical O'Donovan Rosa y el líder del movimiento de los derechos de propiedad Michael David vieron de niños cómo desahuciaron a sus familias. During the land leak, the famine is an image which is used to say we're not going back there. La idea de una Irlanda independiente de Gran Bretaña se difunde en Estados Unidos se recaudan millones de dólares para apoyar la causa. Those who left Ireland, especially those who went to America, their anger was politicized and they blamed the British government for their exile. The Irish Americans in the late 19th century, they begin to interpret the famine as part of the rationale for an independent Ireland. They let them starve, they let them die, they let them come to America on the coffin ships. This is the way the British treated us. 
En Irlanda, las últimas décadas del siglo XIX ven el nacimiento de una generación joven de nacionalistas culturales, determinados a impedir la desaparición del gaélico y de su cultura. From the 1880s onwards, a generation suddenly kind of said, okay, we have to take responsibility for this. And because of that, you get this extraordinarily experimental culture, the Gaelic League, the Abbey Theatre, the Celtic Revival, and a huge effort to reimagine Ireland to stop ourselves being swallowed whole by a British project. La Asociación Atlética Gaélica pasa a ser una organización nacional que fomenta la cultura y deportes autóctonos como el hurling, uno de los deportes de pelota más rápidos. Michael Cusack, when he started the GA, really wanted to kind of say, get up off your knees, stop being kind of crawling slaves, you need to stand up. That's the response to the famine. Mediante una lucha revolucionaria que duró una década, los revolucionarios irlandeses consiguieron echar a Gran Bretaña de casi toda la isla 70 años después del fin de la hambruna. Esos seis condados de Ulster se llamarán Irlanda del Norte y permanecerán en Reino Unido. Con la firma del Tratado Anglo-Irlandés en 1922, se establece un estado independiente libre de gobernarse a su manera. La hambruna tiene un mayor legado por los millones de familias que huyeron a Australia, Nueva Zelanda, Gran Bretaña, Canadá y Estados Unidos y crearon nuevas vidas. Con el tiempo se integran en las sociedades que les han acogido. Muchos se hacen líderes en la iglesia, negocios, cultura y política. Hoy, los más de 70 millones de la diáspora irlandesa dicen descender de los refugiados desesperados que dejaron Irlanda durante la hambruna. Given what they came from, it is, I think, one of the most remarkable achievements of any people in the world. The famine was a humanitarian catastrophe. We know that the British state could have done better. So the story will be a constant reminder for long periods ahead about what to do and what not to do about famines. What the Irish famine tells us, what happens in a society where you divide people into different groups, where you have an us and them society. The ultimate consequences in the Irish famine was that you had people not given access to resources because of the social class and that eventually led to the deaths. Many of the same difficulties and prejudices that were faced by Irish migrants who were fleeing in conditions of absolute deprivation and poverty are similar to some of the hostilities that we see happening in Europe today with the arrival of immigrants from the Middle East in particular. We should never lose sight of the fact that those open borders into uh, North America at that time was a great help just as open borders in other places today would be a great help to poor people. I think if we feel anything, it is never again. Famines don't have to happen in the world now, they didn't have to happen historically. So if we take anything away, I don't think it should be anger. I think it should be an understanding that it didn't need to happen then, it doesn't need to happen now. Lalo 